So I've, I, I, I've taken some notes, and I'm going to see if I can turn these into some questions. Uh, I'll throw out a provocative opening for this group. Um, abortion and contraception are technological quick fixes. So is legislation against abortion. So are uh, uh, ecclesiastical rules against contraception. Both are technological quick fixes because they don't get at the cause of the problem. And if they don't get at the cause of the problem, they don't solve the problem. You can't solve the problem, it doesn't go away. That's a proposition. You can debate that if you want, but I'm gonna connect it to the next piece. Um, oh, that was Rebecca's time. Um, when you have 15 minutes, I have to like sit my pen and hold it. Because um, I think one of the things that you were getting at um, is that this is a multifactorial problem, right? And if we're gonna solve it, we have to get to the real causes. I think Julie especially, you, know, you opened with this. These women were coming to the panel or the, the commission with real life stories and trying, and that experience was, was speaking to the commission. Um, um, but even as we move forward, um, these issues of bodily integrity, why women are having abortions, right? We're not quite getting yet at the source. Charlie, I think, is, uh, is, get, is getting closer to the source, or a source I would like to identify that nobody ever talks about. Um, and in your conversation, you use all of these words, right? Marketplace, product, throw away culture, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I would argue that one thing that people don't really talk about is that one of the driving factors behind uh, all the dynamics that you identified and the need for the need, the social need for abortion and contraception is the development of capitalism in the post-war period um, driven by a kind of economics uh, articulated by Milton Friedman, developed by the Chicago School um, that exploded in neoliberalism in the, in the 70s and 80s. And we have a very conservative Catholic culture which is extraordinarily HV pro-life, but will never ever criticize capitalism. We see that playing out in the reception of Laudate Si. Um, uh, and we see this in all these other sorts of spaces. So how can we, how can we side with you Hardly. Um, and identifying all these, these dynamics that you talked about as problematic, you know, porn, sex robots, all this commodification on both sides, sex and reproduction, uh, the economic problems driving women, without ever criticizing one of the real engines, the, si the invisible hand engine beside, behind this question. Go to. Is that for me? That's for all of you. That's for all of you. This is where you spawn. Well, um, I'll just start. But I, I mean, unless others want. Okay. Um, so Marco Rubio recently, um, both during the campaign and recently, has said he's ex interested in exploring the idea of some version of federally mandated paid family leave for women. Now, here's a guy who is in other contexts, radically implicated in what you just laid down as being a problem. So what, what is changing with him? What is going on with him? I think that's a very fascinating question. Inclu maybe it's just trying to moderate to run against Trump in 2020, I don't know. Um, but let's put the best spin on it possible and say that he's having some kind of shift here. I wonder if what's happening uh, with someone like him, and not, not a few others are being are more in, on the right or more interested in talking about federally mandated paid family leave. I think what's happened is, and this gets to your first point as well, I think as they see the implications of what it will mean for women when prenatal children, in their view, are given legal protection, they're, they're good people at heart and they say, we have to do something to help women in desperate, difficult situations if we do this. And so for people whose primary value, or yeah, primary value is defending basic human life, 
fundamentally vulnerable human life with equal protection of our laws. I think that has moved some of them to say, maybe my Milton Friedman, um, Atlas Shrug type of approach to this is, is wrong, or at least needs nuance. Uh, because I really care more about babies than I care about free markets. Now there are some people who care more about free markets than babies, in fact, maybe a majority. But there are some who are, in fact, in my view, taking a hard look at what sorts of social supports would be necessary um, to really honor women and their bodily autonomy and their social autonomy and their um, uh, economic uh, freedom, vocational freedom, uh, if we in fact do what we have to do if we care about equal justice for all people, which is, in my view, give prenatal children equal protection of our laws. So that's just a quick kind of response. Rebecca, I think, wants to add something. If this thing works, okay. Um, I was thinking about this issue of um, market commodity as it pertains to human sexuality both before and after the sexual revolution because what you see is that the sexual revolution happened for reasons, um, some of them very good reasons, and I have no desire to dial back to before then because before then, you still have this issue of sex as commodity, uh, reproduction as commodity, and fundamentally women as commodity. Um, and I think that the capitalist um, libertarian model, which America is so infatuated with, is compounding this issue tremendously. But I think it goes back much further than that. In the formative texts of Western civilization, what we see is men fighting over women as property. That's the premise of the Iliad, and that's the premise of the great epic of the Old Testament oh, of King David. And so I think we need to reevaluate not just our market economy, capitalist economy, oh, this oh, obsession with money and profit, but also uh, how we regard women and just how rooted a patriarchal idea of women as property is in our civilization and how much has that uh, infected the Catholic tradition? Oh, how much has that kind of crept in on the, the margins uh, of the gospel? I agree, I think, with Charlie that, um, that you, can't, you can't separate the question of capitalism from what's going on here in this document. I think we agree on that. And all the things that Charlie talked about having to do with reproduction, um, that's, all, that's all true. Um, and, and everything that we're seeing in terms of what's going on in hookup culture that is really coming out and a whole discussion of what's now being called bad sex in addition to sexual violence, uh, it's bad. <laughs> That I wonder, uh, though, two things. One, um, does does the um, does the market logic capture the reasoning of women who are getting abortions? So the kinds of stories that I was talking about, both from Guttmacher and from crisis pregnancy centers, don't capture women talking in terms of productivity in the market. They seem to be talking about relational responsibilities that they're trying to juggle and or that they're feeling pressured about. But they seem to be talking, at least using the language of relationship and not necessarily the language of the market. So I'm sure that that language is, is out there, but I wonder if it captures all that's going on and so is that, the way, is that necessarily the way to solve it? And the, and the other question is, um, does that logic, if that logic is more salient in the in hookup culture made possible, I would agree, by, by contraception, does that capture what's going on in the lives of married Christians who are using contraception? And, and that's where I'm not as certain. Um, I don't think we necessarily have those stories. Um, we have more of them from Protestants because they're allowed to talk about it. Um, but we, so we do have some of that, but there are very few narratives that I can even think of of Catholic couples, there are a few, um, but not very many. 
But I would venture that if, if we were allowed to hear those stories, we, we would hear um, some stories of, of love and sharing and, and pleasure and power and intimacy made possible by contraception in the same way that we also hear, I think also important to find, to note that we hear those beautiful stories in couples using NFP that we didn't hear when people were using rhythm, right? Um, but there's, so there's a lot of good news about sex, I think, especially in the context of committed relationships and marriage that maybe isn't captured by, by framing the conversation in terms of the market. Um, right, and I think Partly in response to some of your stuff, I was also thinking more on the, the unitive side of humana vitae, which we're not really talking about here, right? Though, um, but I think on both sides, and, and again, it's multifactorial, right? This is, this is just one, I think, big factor that people don't talk about, this engine that's driving it. Um, but to practice um, a lot of these sort of NFP lifestyle practices requires that you be counter, ec economically countercultural, right? Perhaps, have a one income family, which in this culture is more and more and more difficult, right? Um, and that there are, you know, when we are worried about family values and the divorce rate and, uh, you know, a lot of that is driven by um, the, the increasing structure of um, economic demands on families. Um, uh, two uh, job couples, what do you call these, right? You know, two income households. Um, which, you know, sometimes is a good thing, but it has certain kinds of pressures attached to it that we don't get behind to understand what's, what's putting pressure on the unitive side as well. Um, so, we just lift that up. You can discuss this at your tables as well. We'll move on to a second question. Um, ecological injustices were mentioned. Flint was mentioned. Uh, Charlie mentioned something that spurred this. Um, I am not familiar with um, um, an African-American Catholic perspective on humana vitae. Uh, ha have, has this question been analyzed from the perspective of race? Um, and that's just a question I don't know the answer to. Um, I do know one um, pro-life social justice, Black Lives Matter, activist and doula who has been working uh, in Texas. Her name is Cecily Smith, and I highly recommend her work because she looks at how um, economic, ecological injustice and racial injustice end up affecting the lives of mothers and babies, uh, and how there's a much higher rate of uh, maternal death and um, uh, infant death in African-American communities. And she does a wonderful job of laying out why all of this happens. And unfortunately, there's a tendency among some pro-lifers only to bring up the race issue in order to say that um, there are more abortions happening in black communities. Therefore, pro-choicers are eugenic people who are targeting these communities instead of, again, as has been reiterated, looking at why these women might seek abortions. And actually, many of them really don't want to. What, what Cecily Smith emphasized was that this is a culture in which motherhood is valued and care of women by other women is valued. Oh, so this is not an issue of pressure from the sinister pro-choice forces, nor is it an issue of people being irresponsible and uncaring, which unfortunately I saw in, implied in an article, I think it was in Crisis, um, that, you know, look at these African-American women choosing abortions, isn't this dreadful? Uh, instead, it's, there is um, systemic and structural racial injustice that makes it much harder for women who are responsible, loving, hardworking, and caring to uh, to choose life in the way that they actually want to. I don't um, have data ready to hand on this, but part of what I was going to say in my remarks I never got a chance to say was um, 
to highlight the movement of some very privileged people um, who are increasingly trying to move away from hormonal contraception as their way of um, trying to space births or, or um, separate sex from procreation in some way. Um, and it's not uh, right-wing Catholics or something like this. Increasingly, it's more secular people. Um, the website Quartz just had an article maybe last month or so detailing some of these stories that are especially alive on social media and Instagram and other places. <clears throat> and the article called it the pro-kale anti-hormone movement, which I think is uh, pretty revealing. Uh, but tellingly, this, is, this can be um, contrasted with increasing uh, attempts on the part of physicians, especially those that deal with vulnerable uh, minority populations, to simply try to give them long-acting contraception with very high levels of hormones, even higher than the pill, and just say, deal with that for two decades, that's your deal, because reasons. Um, so I think there's a question of racial justice there. When we have rich, white, religious, or secular people saying, I'm kind of done with hormones. There's a lot of data to show this has a de deleterious effect on many different kinds of people, including depression and sometimes suicide. European studies have shown the connection in many important ways. Um, it's time to get off this. Uh, and they have the resources to do it, um, uh, often related to reasons of racial injustice. But then again, for, for people of, a, of different means, and especially for racial minority communities, we often just kind of punt and say, there's your IUD, you know? Um, all right, one last question, and then we'll go to our table discussions. So all three of you mentioned dialogue, um, and named it as a pro-life and social justice practice, which I thought was great, right, just to call it that. Um, um, but I ask my students this frequently. Where is it possible for that kind of dialogue to happen in the actual culture we live in? Um, I mean, I'm looking for places. The closest I can get is the classroom for 15 weeks. Um, but that costs a lot of money and most people aren't in that space. Um, and I just, I'm kind of at a loss for where else it, it is actually happening. I can think of some places it might be able to happen, but um, wisdom for the group. I don't know that Twitter is quite the right place. Oh, sorry, Kelly. Oh, can I take this opportunity to invite you all to a place where dialogue will happen? Um, I work with an organization called Revolution of Tenderness, and our director, unlike me, is non-combative, caring, and affectionate, and she's been a wonderful influence on me. Um, but we have events called Festival of Friendship oh, in Pittsburgh. It'll be late September. And one thing that we emphasize there is that it is kind of a non, not non-political in the classical sense, but non-political in the beat you over the head sense. It's a space where we have art, we have dialogue, we have information on human trafficking, uh, immigration, poetry readings, um, and you know, this is this is just one a tiny space I've experienced, but it's free to the public, and so you know, it's not it, unlike the classroom. Anyone can walk in, and it would be lovely if all cities across the United States were to have events like this. Right, but so you're you're having to create a space yes. for that to happen, right? Because it's otherwise not. Yeah, it's hard to find it. Yes. Oh. I mean, I think it's a great it's a great question. I, I do think that there that there's a hunger for those kinds of conversations, and as much as people are worried about, especially discussing the abortion issue, there is there is increasingly a hunger for talking across these lines of division, and so I I, I guess I would challenge those of us in the room who are educators and or of some kind and do have these skills in moderating conversations to figure out how we might be able to move into other spaces and encourage a different level of conversation, whether that's bars or, or, or cafes or online spaces or whatever it is. And, and, and also to think of part of our mission as training our, our students to have those kinds of skills so that they can be people 
who can lead those conversations in whatever spaces they end up in. I would second everything that's been said and um, uh, also say that the classroom is a very important place for this. But let me awful, also offer a semi-hopeful uh, remark about our national politics. So, so I'm a board member of Democrats for Life and have been part of some of our lobbying attempts to get precisely these kinds of crossover um, uh, bills or legislative proposals passed or at least considered. And what I've learned uh, is that lots and lots of individual legislators and their staffs are very interested in it. But when it comes time to make it public or to do some public work on it, um, uh, interest groups uh, rear their ugly head and don't allow, in fact, them to, they'll say, we just gave you all this money to get you elected. We're going to primary you if you do anything like this. Um, so even though in their hearts, they're very much open to that, um, uh, Many, if not most of them, feel like their hands are tied because money and because resources. So it's, I mean, it's, I'm not saying anything new here, but it, until we have some kind of serious campaign finance reform and stopping um, thinking of money as speech in, in a strict sense, it's gonna be very difficult. But if we were able to pull something like that off, I think a lot of, I know a lot of legislators would feel more open to a pro-life social justice intersection. You did say something new, because I just learned you can use primary as a verb. Uh -huh. I did not know that. Um, but you also, y'all didn't come back, you had said this in your talk, which is what prompted my question. We didn't talk, we didn't talk about parishes. We didn't talk about Catholic parishes mm -hmm. being places where real dialogue can happen. And it seems to me that that is an infrastructure that's sitting there waiting to be utilized. How many Catholic parishes are there in the United States? They don't even have to be Catholic. Um, but we don't think of that as a place of dialogue where people can sustain a dialogue over time. Um, and what does that say about our ecclesiology in light of the fact we're talking about humanity? Um, i just say something quickly about that. Sure. Uh, not just in parishes, but in dioceses, in part due to financial shortfalls, but I think also due to uh, what Julie called the growing hunger for this. Um, Pro-life and um, say human concerns or social justice offices are in some places are being combined, yeah. right? Um, uh, and so that's another, just to piggyback on what you just said, that's another hopeful place, I think, right. to focus. Right. Oh, good, so he's ended on a note of hope. Now, um, where are we at? Oh, good. Um, we would like you all, spurred by this, uh, to spend about, we were gonna say 20, but we'll get 17 minutes uh, discussing uh, what was um, uh, raised in the comments um, and or um, what you see as the legacy of Humanity Vitae, maybe over the next 25 years, we don't have to look 50 years out, um, and or what it means to be pro-life today. Uh, so, what do you call this, Mike? Not see one, do one, teach one. It's uh, pair, pair, care, and share, or something like that. So, um, uh, we'll be back in 17 minutes and we'll hear some of your thoughts.